West Michigan has seen very few strong to violent tornadoes, and we're coming up on the 40th anniversary of one that rolled right through downtown Kalamazoo on May 13th. And one of our members of Storm Team 8 was working when that happened. We want to talk to the chief now, Bill Steffen. Bill, what do you remember about that day? I remember the day well. It was a weekday. I believe it was a Tuesday, and I was working the morning shift, so I had gotten to work about 4 o'clock in the morning. I had stayed through the afternoon because of the threat of severe weather. Now, the Kalamazoo tornado started pretty close to 4 o'clock, and it actually started in uh, the far eastern part of Van Buren County. I believe the tornado was on the ground for about uh, 11 uh, miles or so. It was interesting because at 3 in the afternoon, I had plotted a hand-plotted weather map and I had remarked to uh, Craig James at the time that this looked pretty identical to a, a severe weather case that we had studied at one of the conferences that I had gone to about a tornado situation that happened in North Texas. Uh, we had a warm front between Grand Rapids and Kalamazoo, about a 20 degree temperature difference. It was mid-50s in Grand Rapids and it was mid-70s down in Kalamazoo in the warm sector. Thunderstorms uh, developed uh, with a rather small low pressure system out over Lake Michigan and then moved east. Uh, as the tornado developed in uh, Van Buren County, it went through a pretty much a rural area, then uh, went through the west side of Kalamazoo and right directly over the downtown. It downed so many of those big trees in Bronson Park. And the, uh, the ISB building, which is now the uh, Comerica Bank building, had all of its windows blown out. Uh, there were uh, five fatalities with that storm. Uh, one of the fatalities, I believe, occurred where Gilmore's department store, which is about a five-story building, the west wall caved in. Uh, that was a brick structure, if I remember right. Uh, about 79 injuries with that particular uh, tornado, and uh, a lot of uh, phone service was knocked out through the uh, downtown area. I remember them telling people, uh, not to uh, use the phones and tie them up because they were being jammed by all the calls. We didn't have cell service at that time. Uh, a lot of the roads were uh, blocked in the downtown area, which made it difficult for emergency vehicles to get through. There were actually cars that were flipped over uh, because of the strong force of the winds. This was an F3 tornado. We weren't quite to the EF scale yet, but this was the F scale. So it was a pretty significant tornado, and again, it was noteworthy because it went through a downtown area. Yeah. When did you start to uh, realize how significant this tornado was? Was it when the damage reports started coming in? I know now we have such great technology that damage reports are close to real time with consumers' energy outage maps. But then you had to wait a bit for just information to come in. So when was that moment when you started to realize that this was a historic situation for West Michigan? Well, first of all, this was 1980. We still had the plexiglass maps and the magic markers. We did not have computer graphics back then, and we did not have Doppler radar. Uh, at the time, we had an old uh, RCA AVQ-10 uh, radar that was actually built for an aircraft and not really for weather. So we really didn't uh, see the storm on uh, radar at that time. We just saw that there was a, a thunderstorm over that particular area. Um, we started getting a couple of calls from people that we knew down there that something was up, and then you're, you know, you're always hesitant to believe that first call. You need confirmation before you really go with something, but uh, we got a message from the mayor's office in uh, Kalamazoo, and then we knew that something pretty terrible had happened. We didn't have sky cams back then. Uh, we relied uh, basically on spotters, and of course we still do rely on storm spotters to uh, follow storms and also to report on what's going on. But Back at that time, there were so many people, if you look at, at film, there's actual film of the tornado itself, and there's uh, a lot of eyewitness reports. People were just walking around in a daze and trying to uh, you know, avoid uh, the uh, areas that were hit the hardest. Uh, it was difficult to travel in those areas. A lot of people were uh, working at the time. This was 4 o'clock in the afternoon. The tornado was on the ground, if I remember right, for a, a little less than half an hour. It was about 25 minutes or so, and during that time, it covered about 11 miles. Uh, the uh, Bronson Park area, huge trees were down. In fact, the, uh, the tree that Abraham Lincoln stood under in Bronson Park was one of the trees that was knocked down during that 1980 tornado. Um, and then as, as time went on, we got more and more reports as emergency vehicles got to uh, stranded areas about house damage on the uh, west side of uh, Kalamazoo and then damage all the way uh, well east of town too before the tornado finally lifted. Yeah, I think this was one of those tornadoes for a lot of Michiganders that 
broke the rumor that was perpetuated back in that day that tornadoes can't go through cities. Of course, we know now tornadoes can go through cities, but I'm sure that must have been a shock to so many people. What other things do you think this tornado changed for West Michigan specifically and, and just for the time? Did anything change after this tornado? Well, I think we got together to try and anticipate how we could better warn people. Uh, technology was in the process of starting to change, and of course, uh, nowadays, uh, we have polygons instead of county warnings. Uh, we have um, you know, warnings coming out on, on many different uh, devices, including your cell phone. Uh, I think as time goes on, we're looking ahead to uh, how we would handle a situation like this now. Um, it would be uh, something where you'd, you'd want to, first of all, get people out of the way as best you could. This was a situation where, uh, you know, we had a, a lone thunderstorm here producing this uh, strong tornado, and uh, uh, we, we had so many people in the path of this tornado. How do you actually keep these people safe? Um, you know, keep people, keep people away from windows. There were so many windows in downtown Kalamazoo that were knocked out by this storm, and all that broken glass was all over on the streets. Uh, you know, if you were driving over that, of course, uh, back in those days, you could get a flat tire pretty easy, too. So it was very difficult to get around. A, a number of people that, that had vehicles downtown actually walked out of the downtown, had somebody pick them up to get them out of the downtown area. Uh, and, of course, like I said, we had casualties. We had five fatalities. Seventy-nine that were injured were transported. Uh, there were other people that self-treated. And um, so there were a number of people that we had to keep track of there at, at first. And then, of course, there was the cleanup. This was $50, $60 million worth of damage in 1980 dollars. So this was a pretty significant hit to the uh, Kalamazoo area. Yeah. I'm going to put you on the spot here for a moment. I know you just mentioned a lot of windows were blown out. We've seen that in some of the video. And we had so many people that experienced the Kalamazoo tornado. Do you remember any particular stories that came out of that tornado, survivor stories or just witness stories? I know it's been 40 years. Talk to Emily Leonard, okay? Talk, talk, talk to Emily because her, uh, her home was right there uh, in the path and she could tell you some stories there. Uh, of course, Ray Hackman, our Kalamazoo observer, saw the tornado. Uh, we also talked, when I went down there, with a lot of the people that were involved in uh, emergency management at the time. Uh, not everybody saw the tornado. Quite a few people did. Uh, some people didn't know what it was as it approached the downtown area. But uh, a lot of people, you know, like I said, uh, had, had scant amount of time, a matter of seconds, to run for cover to get away from windows uh, as, they, uh, as they broke and that glass started flying around in the tornado. But uh, some interesting, uh, interesting stories came out of it. I think, uh, you know, to have a an, an F3 tornado go through a downtown area uh, you know, and, and only have five uh, fatalities with that, uh, you know, it could have been a whole lot worse than it was. And I love that you were there with your hand plotted map back in the day, limited technology, and you were like... I still have that somewhere. Oh, i got to find that. I, I have that here at home somewhere. Uh, uh, Craig and I were about the only TV meteorologists I know of that meticulously hand plotted weather maps. We did them uh, four times a day, and it would take about an hour to do that. We had our Venus Paradise pencils, and we colored red ISO lines and blue ISO lines and yellow ISO lines, and, and just tried to look for every little clue there would be for uh, what kind of weather that we would have coming up. Uh, in the olden days, we only did a two-day forecast. We did the forecast for tomorrow and the next day, and that was about it. Nowadays, the forecast for day five is about as accurate as the two, uh, second day forecast was back in 1980, so we've come a long way. Well, we are lucky to have you then. West Michigan is lucky to have you now. Thank you so much for taking the time to just walk us through this event. My pleasure.